So we are streaming it right now for the 11 o'clock. So Chris, there's going to be four or 500 people that want to know what your haircut looks like. They can come in next Sunday and find out, right? <laughs> Looking good though, man. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything, but what's on the screen does. We're picking up right where we started last week. This is one message divided into three weeks. I am not necessarily doing it in a way that if you miss all three of them or any one of them, you are missing something. So go back on the app and, or the website, either one, and listen to last week. And definitely make sure you catch next week where we bring this thing home. But we are right here in the middle of one message this morning that we begin in the book of Acts where Luke is writing. And I saw a pattern develop in Acts. I don't know that this has exegetical significance and someone might want to nitpick at me, but I saw a pattern here in the first six chapters of Acts that had some meaning for me. So I'm going to use it whether it's exegetically sound or not anyway, and uh, you guys can shoot me an email. In chapter 1, he begins with the church, the church alone, the church in person, what they're doing. They're in the upper room. They're gathered for prayer. They're electing an apostle to replace Judas, and we, we get this image of the church in the upper room praying together. And then in chapter 2, we see the church worldwide, out in the world. Peter preaches, and the church begins rapidly growing. New followers of Christ are added to the church, and, and the church is growing rapidly. And then at the end of chapter 2, Luke goes from the church and, it's, and what it's doing in the world and comes back inside to the functioning of the church itself, and he gives a picture of church life, of the apostles' teaching, sharing in meals, and that familiar passage in Acts chapter 2 that we opened with last week. And then in 3, 1 through 4, 22, he goes from in life inside the church, he goes back out to the church in the world, and we see the church again, and we see the first instance of persecution. Now, Peter and John are teaching. They get arrested, and that's one of the first places that we see persecution here. So the church in the world having pressure put on it. And then in chapter 4, through the rest of chap through part, the first part of chapter 5, he moves back inside to the life of the church where they're gathering regularly for prayer. We learn more about the generosity and care that they have for one another, but we also learn about the hypocrisy and the lying of Ananias and Sapphira. So the church is out in the world. He comes back or starts with the church together, goes to the church's work in the world, comes back together, church's work and persecution, comes back together inside the church in five, and we see lying and hypocrisy. We see mess going on inside the life of the church. And then in, in verse 12 of chapter five, Luke turns to the focus of of the church again out in the world describing the apostles as witnesses before the Sanhedrin and that resulted in them being flogged and now in chapter 6 where we were last week Luke again turns back to the church showing us that as followers of Christ were added to the body of the church as it grew in size which is what I'm referring to as mass in this series is is the growth in number of followers of Christ in the church is mass problems occurred which I'm referring to as mess when you bring people together and increase mass you increase mess and I'm using those two words for those two reasons because it makes a fantastic slide thank you Maggie Payne <laughs> love that slide anyone else like that slide so by alternating this pattern, Luke seems to be showing us that the church must maintain a balance. And I'm not sure if he's just doing good storytelling here, but he did something for me from going to the church to the world and the church and the church's effect in the world and back to the life of the church and, and back to the life of the world. And one of the things that I see in that pattern in Luke's telling of the story of the early church is that within an increase in growth, a healthy church will address the mess through relationship a healthy church of bringing broken, sinful people together under the grace of Jesus Christ, broken, sinful people who are forgiven come together, and there is mess that comes out of that, that a healthy church, through relationship, through biblical teaching, through care confrontation, will disciple people. And as we are doing through this series of these three weeks, a healthy church will proactively, preemptively address potential mess before it causes friction without gaining traction. And you'll get that when you watch last week's message. Some churches are so inwardly focused that they forgot their mission in the world. They talk about their mission in the world, 
but they get consumed with running the internal life of the church that they do not recover their sense of mission. They become consumed. They, could, they, they become consumed with personal preferences. Can you imagine the disciples, the apostles together in the upper room praying together, having fellowship, tongues of cloven fire coming down, all this spiritual powerhouse stuff happening. They go, man, we like that so much. Let's keep it that way. Because the second we go out and teach and preach on the day of Pentecost and we add more people to the life of the church, we're going to lose this feeling that we have in the upper room. So let's just become the apostles of personal preference and we want all of our experiences together to be an upper room experience. So some churches get that inwardly focused. They become consumed with keeping preferences up to everybody's uh, desire And they get so focused on a a few of the messes in the internal life of the church that they lose their sense of mission and they become consumed with personal preferences, not wanting to prepare the house for grandchildren and new life from last week. Then those churches cease to exist. And sadly, throughout this coming year, there will be churches all over central Ohio who will shut their doors physically and in ministry they will shut their doors permanently not surviving the challenges of the last year and a half and it will be because before that challenge arrived those churches had already become institutions of personal preference and they're not going to survive it where healthy churches like we see going on here in acts whether that's the exegetical point of of Luke moving in and out that way. That's that's something that I saw there. Healthy churches maintain a balance of dealing with the mess that comes that as you increase mass, add followers of Christ, while staying focused on the task of advancing the kingdom of God in this world. Deal with the internal church. The church goes back out in the world and does awesome stuff, which will bring more people to Christ, which will increase the mass, which will in turn increase the mess, which will require a healthy church to maintain balance by dealing with the mess that comes with mass while staying focused on the task of taking the gospel to the world, which will in turn, taking the gospel to the world, bring more people to Christ, which will increase the mass, which will increase the mess, which will require a healthy church to maintain balance of dealing with the mess that comes from adding mass while staying focused on the task of taking the gospel to the world. You see the cycle here? You want me to go again? You reach people for Christ, they become a part of the life of the church. There's more mess. When there's more mess, the church has to deal with the mess that's created there through discipleship. And then the church gets back out into the world doing its thing, which will, and and that cycle keeps happening over and over again. And that's why we will get into more of this next week. That's why some of you sitting here right now and some of you watching online, whether you realize it or not, some of you have been given a gift from God called discernment to help identify and deal with the mess that's in the church from new people coming to Christ who are spiritually broken being transformed into Christ likeness there are some of you who have been given the gift of teaching who God's going to use you to teach throughout the life of the church and 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 lead in different ways and teach in different ways some of you have been given the gift of wisdom some mercy some leadership And God is going to use you sitting here today or watching online. He's going to use you in the life of the church in that cycle of advancing the kingdom in this world, bringing more people into the body of Christ, creates more mess, dealing with the mess, going out and reaching the world. And you are going to get to be a part of that cycle. And many of you already are, or this church would not be where it is today because many of you are already participating in that cycle. So spiritual gifts are extremely important and help us through that cycle, and we'll get into that more next week, but let's go back to our specific passage from last week. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So as I studied this passage more and more over the last several months and the three months or so I've been preparing for this message, I just like, what are some, one of the things I do when I'm writing messages, like what's some observations that I can make about this? And let's, let's see if these observations hold up this morning. Doesn't mean everything I say is right. I just like to think it is. 
The first observation I made was, well, the church was meeting people's physical needs. There's going to be churches that don't make it through in central Ohio through the last year and a half. They're going to shut down. And one of the reasons is why is they were just having church services and holy huddles in the upper room. But the active participant body of Christ is in the world meeting the physical needs of people who are under-resourced. Powerful. Can't wait until next week. I just got a picture and didn't have time to work it in today of the water tanks going into Sechochoke, Guatemala that you guys made possible. Yeah. We'll be doing the community meal this week. Or I don't know if it's this week or not, but we'll be doing the community meal this month is what I meant to say. We'll be doing the food distribution this month. But the church is physically meeting people's needs. Here's another observation I made about this. That this problem of uh, this accusation against discrimination, the scripture doesn't speak to this, so give me a little latitude here. The problem was probably not deliberate. The Hellenistic Jews, the Greek Jews felt like their widows were being slighted, while the Hebrew widows were getting more of their fair share in the daily distribution. Doesn't mean that's what was happening, but what it does mean is that these people who come to Christ had on a lifetime of cultural lenses. Cultural lenses that says the Hebrews are going to discriminate against the Hellenistic Jews. So when they come into the body of Christ, they already have on glasses looking for discrimination against them as Hellenistic Jews. So the, the complaining sorry, doesn't mean it was actually happening. It may have been happening. The scripture is not speaking to that. They come from two different cultures, two different places, and they're a part of the same church now. Both groups in the church in Jerusalem had come to faith in Jesus, both accepting and following Jesus. It did not erase their cultural assumptions. It didn't erase their cultural backgrounds. It didn't erase their racism just by coming to Jesus Christ. That's transformation that the Holy Spirit does in our heart. And they come into life and ministry with these glasses on that they're looking at the distribution of food for the widows and going, hey, this ain't fair and, you know, and whatever. And either way, whether it was happening or wasn't happening, either way, one of the groups was working through their cultural lenses. So it's naive to think that since you're a follower of Christ, you're not going to experience any conflict in the life of the church or any mess. You're also naive to think that you don't bring your pre-Christian assumptions into the life of the church and you create a little of the mess yourself. When you are added to the mass, you have lenses on that are affected by the life that you've experienced, by past experiences you've had in other churches maybe, or ones that your parents forced you to go to. And, and you're wearing these lenses looking for the same things. And you, you're wearing those lenses. You're bringing those cultural assumptions. It's naive to think that you don't have some of those. Another observation I made is that great way to fix this problem on the next slide. You can prevent conflicts and little messes by not meeting needs and not preparing the body for growth. Here's the observation I made. The problem arose out of a ministry. It was because they wanted to take care of widows who needed food in that society. The church is just going, hey, there's a need. We want to meet it. They start meeting it. And by meeting needs, conflict arose out of ministry. When you serve, expect mess to be a part of the package while doing God's work. They could have prevented this problem by not meeting the needs of widows. By staying in the upper room, just say, hey, we're going to redo the same thing every time. We'll get together. We'll pray together. We'll pray that the Holy Spirit will settle on us. We'll pray that we all have this, uh, uh, this good feeling that sends tingles up our spine. But the Holy Spirit's like, nope, I'm activating you into the world. Now go serve. Go take care of people's needs. You go take care of people's needs. And I guarantee you in the life of the church, problems will arise. Personality conflicts will clash. Philosophy of ministry of why is the community meal done that way and not this way? Why is the pantry done that way and not this way? Why did that ministry get shut down? down and not this one conflicts will arise when you serve expect mess to be a part of the package and if it's not someone's hiding something i can make you a promise someone's hiding something you hang in there long enough i'll i'll create a little of the mess for you <laughs> you can prevent conflicts and little messes in the life of the church by not meeting anyone's needs just get together for worship and singing turn around and leave 
But what's the trade-off? The trade-off is not advancing the kingdom of God, not doing the work that God's put the mission of the church on. That's the trade-off. So then I sit around after making observations about a scripture passage and I start thinking, what's some application to this? Not application to step on anyone's toes. I start with the United States of America. And I think about Christians all over America, and this is where my application come from today. There are some of you who are going to think this application came from your life. It did not. This came two months ago from looking at the United States of America and studying this passage and saying, what are some applications to any Christian in America? What is the risk of any Christian in America? How can we apply this from Acts to our lives? Well, the first application is this. If you begin serving in ministry, you will discover mess in the mass. 100% guaranteed. If you're here, you're watching online, you're not a follower of Christ, we want to lead you to the person of Jesus Christ. We want to envelop you into the life and the community and the family and the body of the church, and I can make you a promise as we get you serving in ministry. You will run into mess. You'll bring mess too. God's way to deal with the problem, as we see in chapter 6, is is, it's not the grumbling and complaining but to go directly to the leaders of the ministry that where the mess is occurring and address the mess. That's the other reason I like the word mess. I can say that. Address the mess that comes from the mass, that comes from adding people to the kingdom of God. Address the mess. Address the issue. Another one, another application I see for the church across America, increasing in mass Reaching people for Christ requires a growing church to develop new levels of organization. When the apostles heard about the problem in chapter 6, they called together the whole congregation. They did not blame anyone. They didn't lash out. They didn't, we don't see here in scripture what played out, whether that was actually a problem or a perceived problem, because that happens all the time too. They did not lash out or blame anyone. They didn't get, they didn't uh, lash out in self-defense. Rather, we see in chapter six, they explained their philosophy of ministry. They laid out some guidelines. They assigned the congregation the task of finding seven people who could lead this widow feeding program. And they gave those people the authority to lead that widow feeding program. Wait a second, Greg. Do you mean there was a major leadership issue in a ministry of the church and the pastoral team of the new apostles did not spend all of their time in that ministry solving the problem, but they actually called together the body of Christ, the believers, and said, hey, this is your church. And God has specifically gifted people to lead and given people passion to serve in these ministries. Are you telling me that there's a major leadership issue in the church and the pastoral team of this newly forming church in Acts? They didn't lead that ministry? It's because the church is an organism. The living body of which Christ is the head. But all organisms are organized. The need for new organization grows as the body grows. The apostles here we're willing to change the organizational structure of the church to meet these legitimate needs to prepare the body for new life. We can't have an issue in our, weed, in our widow feeding program. This needs to go well. Who's going to solve this problem? Let's hire another apostle from over in Corinth to come solve this problem for us. No. Hey, this is your church. You're the body of Christ. The apostles believed that God had specifically gifted people, as we'll get into next week, and given passions to people who can come together and lead and serve and participate in those ministries and not just have an apostle that was hired in from out of town to do it. And to prepare the body for new life. A third application I got from this that is going to lead us into communion this morning is that we need to spend some time reflecting on, maybe listing in a note on our phone, and addressing some cultural assumptions that you bring into the body of Christ. Cultural assumptions that when you come into the life of the church, 
where your lenses that you're viewing life in the church through, your assumptions might be a little bit responsible for bringing some of the mess into the life of the church. Now, I think that's going to be a great reflection for us this morning. So I begin thinking about that. I begin thinking in my years of experience in pastoral ministry, what are some of the lenses that I see people wearing when they come into the body of Christ as a new believer or they move from another state into the area and they find your local congregation, get excited about it and want to be a part of it, many of them are wearing these lenses that I'm going to share with you right now. One of the lenses that people wear is to preserve the institution of personal preferences. Wanting a local congregation to be your personal institution of personal preferences of how worship should be done, how ministry should be led, what people should act like, what people should look like, what time things should start, what time things should end, what temperature room should be set on, who should be doing what. And we come with all of these personal preferences about what we think church should look like. And and we're all guilty of this. We've all been guilty of this over time. And across America, believers are guilty of this. Institutions preserve traditions. Not necessarily saying any, anything wrong with that. Many of you love the institution of the Ohio State University, and you love the traditions of the football games and the events that go on around that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. But institutions preserve traditions. But one of the challenges that for the life of the church, and the church is not an institution, it is an organism, but when you view it as an institution, a personal preference, you are trying to preserve a culture of the past. That's what institutions do. They preserve a culture of the past. Not preparing the body for new life, but preparing the body for their own personal preferences so that people who like things the way they like things are the ones who are welcome to be a part of the body of Christ. Or they can find a church that they like that has their personal preferences. Institutions preserve a culture of the past. It's one of the things that I I say that uh, some of you have heard me say in the partnership course, I never wanted to be a pastor and I I didn't like most of them that I knew growing up. And I finally figured out the reason why with a lot of reflection and experience myself. One was because I was ignorant. You know, I understand that now. (laughs) But the other one was I was onto something and that is when I saw pastors trying to preserve institutions of preferences to keep Christians happy in the upper room, that I, I didn't see that in Scripture. That bugged me. When I saw pastors trying to preserve a paycheck and a job by making the church an institution, that, that just rubbed me wrong. Even as a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, 21-year-old, I'd, just, I'd read the Scripture and get excited about what God was doing, and I didn't see an institution in Scripture of the church. I saw an organism, the body of Christ, live, active, always growing, always changing, always reorganizing not an institution of personal preferences. But when you preserve the institution of personal preferences, and on the next one, when you bring your favorite company's paradigm to the church, the body of Christ, that's, a, that's another set of lenses that I have seen for all of my years of pastoral ministry. When I got into ministry vocationally when I was 27 years old, I have seen this over and over and over and over and over and over again. And this is, this is not for New Start. This is for every Christian in America. This is for every Christian in Central Ohio could watch the rest of this message and they will be hearing a message that they need to hear. This isn't just for us here this morning. On the next slide, your favorite company has a hierarchical leadership structure. And you like it. And here's how the model works. And it works well in institutions. It works well in corporations, and here's why in hierarchical structure and institutions and companies works well. In your favorite company or the one that you work for, the one that you used to work for and wish you still did, 100% of the people are paid, controlled by the power of their paycheck, motivated by their paycheck, power is exercised by leadership at the threat of position and paycheck 
in workload, and the farther you get down the hierarchical structure, the less important you are to the organization and the farther you get away from the leader of the organization. And this model works in in companies because as long as you can motivate people and lord over them their paycheck, their position, or their workload, you can manipulate them into the work behavior you want or you let them go. That's an institution. that's That's a company. That works well in that situation. Doesn't necessarily work well in employee satisfaction. Doesn't work well in longevity. Oh my goodness, someone fell on a button upstairs. <laughs> but this model has been conflated in the ministry of the church. Lord, there's nothing. That is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to the hierarchical one real quick. <laughs> uh, But the church is an organism, the body of Christ right there, perfect. The church is an organism, the body of Christ. It's not an institution. Organisms continually prepare the body for new growth. An organism continually, like I said last week about preparing the house for a grandchild, preparing the house for new life, an organism is continually preparing the body for new growth by constantly changing to prepare for new life. I drew that on my iPad. Are you impressed? But the church is a body, an organism where every cell participates and every cell in the body has an equally valuable role. The church around the world is about 0.003% of the ministry that is accomplished is done by people who are paid The other 99.0007 or whatever the math is of ministry that is done in this world for the kingdom of God is done by followers of Christ who are motivated by the great commission, the great commandment, their love for Christ and their love for people. So on the next slide, we add more life to the body and we see the body grow. Christ is at the center of that. He is the head of the church. A person is not a head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And then all these cells and the organism of the body of Christ have an equally important role to play. That is why I intentionally encourage people to call me Greg and not pastor when you're talking to me. I don't care if you ever call me pastor. Pastor is the role that God led me to in this situation. It's not a role that I chose. It's something that I want you guys to know. Nate, Desiree, and myself never set out to be pastors. We never set out to vocationally lead in ministry. But what happened, as we'll look at more next week, is God gifted us. He gave us a passion. And as we were serving in our local churches, all different places that we weren't even aware of each other, I was serving as a volunteer in my church in Mount Vernon. And one day after years of that, the pastor walked up to me and said, I would like for you to quit your job and become the associate pastor of this church. And the church affirmed that and the church calls people into these roles of leadership. We don't do it because we set out to do it or chose to do it. It's a calling, it's a gifting, it's a passion, and it's affirmed by the church. So why do we in America free up people vocationally to lead the church? Why is it so important for us today in receiving communion to understand this? Because we as a church in America, all over the world, they're not able to free up vocationally people to lead the church. But in America, we're just in a cultural context where we have the ability to do it. We do not do it to watch paid professionals perform for us. That's not, that's why a lot of churches do it. And that's why a lot of churches are going to shut down in the weeks and years to come. They treat the church as an institution. Go back to that, go back to that uh, hierarchical slide if you could. They treat the church as an institution where the pastor's at the top and the farther away you get from the leader of the church, the less important your role becomes. And they bring those glasses to the life of the church and the whole time the body of Christ two slides ahead is calling out like, no, Christ is the head of the church. You all have different roles to play. And we free up people vocationally not for the purpose of performing for you, but for the purpose of equipping you and empowering you to lead and serve in the ministries of your church in the areas where God has given you passion to help train you and learn from experience and move you to the life of the church. 
You are a part of the body of Christ and your role in New Start and your minutes or hours serving the body of Christ in this world is as important as anything Nate Porter does in a 50-hour week, is as important as anything as ordained clergy Desiree Calusa does in a 50-hour week, and is as equally as important as anything that Greg McNichols, founding pastor, 50 hours a week, six days a week, For the most part, for the last 22 years, what you do this week in ministry is as valuable in the body of Christ as anything I'll ever do. You are a cell in the body of Christ. New Start is not an institution of personal preferences. It's not a company with all paid employees and a hierarchical leadership structure. New Start is 100% committed to getting 100% of New Starters actively engaged in the body of Christ with your top priority being expanding the work of God in this world. We fail you as your pastoral leadership team if you are here to watch us perform. We fail you. We are 100% committed to getting you involved in every single aspect in life of serving in the church where God has gifted you, where God has given you a passion, and where you can be equipped to serve. You matter. This is your church. This is your church. It is your responsibility to love and serve our children in the ways that God has gifted you and passionate you. It's your responsibility to teach the scripture to others and have face-to-face relationships in a life group with others. It's your role in the kingdom of God to lead and serve our teens. It's your role to 100%. We deal with the things that are going on inside the church so that we can be more effective out in the world. I want to call the band up and I want to read you a passage of scripture as we prepare for communion this morning and I hope anyone watching accidentally from anywhere in the United States or ever sees this video knows that this message is for the church at large the church is not an institution of preferences the church is not your favorite company we're a hierarchical leadership structure the church is the body of Christ a living, growing organism. He is the head of Christ, and you matter every single bit as much as anyone that the church at large collectively frees up vocationally to ordain and serve the church. You are as equally important as that, and I can promise you, if you commit to being a part of New Start, we won't won't perform for your kids. We're going to get your kids involved in ministry. We won't perform for your teens. We're going to teach them a life of service and servanthood and teach them the life of the body of Christ as an organism. And they are as important as a 14-year-old or a 19-year-old. They are as important to the body of Christ as a 68-year-old pastor. That's what we're going to do for them. That's what matters. Amen? Let's stand together. And as we prepare our hearts for communion, I hope the Holy Spirit's just asking you, hey, what lenses do you have on? That's bringing a little bit bit of the mess into the life of the church and how can you deal with it in communion this morning?